I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to Bigfoot, America's Creek Devil. Tom, would you like to make an announcement before we get started? Absolutely. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. we got a really good show today. We have a very special guest who's been with us uh, many times, and... Uh, so if you like the show, we would like to know. Just click the like button and subscribe if you want to get future updates. And if you want to support us, you can do so. There's a link in the description on YouTube. Just click on that for Patreon, and you can do so for as little as a dollar a month. Or you can just go to patreon.com forward slash Creek Devil, and you can do it that way. Much appreciated. That helps us to help you guys to bring you the content. And with that said, I'm going to hand the mic back to Will. All right. Well, we have Lisa with, in New York with us today. And Lisa is, you know, going to talk about her ongoing work and things she's been finding. You sent me some really interesting audio. And uh, you said we could post that on the Facebook page. And I'll do that sure. after the show post. But uh, tell us what's going on. Well, um, the last time I was on the show last year, the end of the year, I'm not quite sure when, um, I had moved up to the Adirondacks and I had found um, my first group and I do a lot of audio recording <clears throat> and I got a lot of uh, great audio and I don't know if you remember, but what I had said my goal for this year was, uh, was to do some research on the population density in my area. Um, now, just because I find X amount of groups in my area can't re isn't really a reflection on everybody's area because it's not apples to apples. But I was just curious. I started with a 15-mile radius uh, from my house, um, and I just found my third group. So early this year, I found my second group, which um, I had spoken privately um, to you about uh, through Facebook chat because they were kind of scary. <laughs> the recordings I was getting were um, a lot of roaring. It sounded like a much larger group. Um, all the uh, groups I found are not out in the wilderness, even though I am in the Adirondacks. They're actually very close to people, and all of the groups I've found have been in um, several hundred acre parcels of woods that are surrounded on all sides by road without exception. And this group in particular was so loud and, and so aggressive sounding that I don't think I have a single recording without multiple gunshots going off just at the times when they're getting really loud. Um, I even went door knocking on the houses closest bordering that forest. And uh, every one of them had heard the gunshots late at night, but uh, nobody knew more than that. And the minute you bring up Bigfoot, you kind of get looked at cross-eyed. Cross so um, I didn't have any luck there. Um, and then uh, shortly after that, I decided to look um, up near the Sakandaga Lake. <clears throat> um, so my first area group is due north of me. The second group I found was due south of me. So going across the lake would be due east. And I went down a power line and uh, went into the woods and I saw a lot of sign. So I said, oh, let me put out a recorder. And sure enough, it seems like every time... Uh, I'm in an area where they are, they put a sentry and it, it sounds like a juvenile every time. And although I didn't get too much audio on it, um, it did throw rocks at the reporter all night long. That's how I knew there was something there. And I was able to get a, um, a pretty good uh, length, um, high-pitched scream that I sent you guys. 
that a friend of mine was able to pull out of the audio, um, like a long howl or a scream. I don't know what you would call it, but it's the first time I've ever recorded one of those. So um, let's see, what else? Well, the recording I sent you, one of them was of the <laughs> infamous Bart Owls we talk about, them imitating the owls. And last fall, I got a great one. And um, I didn't have my Mac computer that I have now. And transferring it into my tablet, I lost the file. And I was so upset. And probably, I think it was earlier, this, maybe in May or June, I was getting so many audios 12 hours long that I was getting backlogged. And I decided to go through one of the older ones from my original area. And um, I got a very loud uh, sounds like a juvenile doing a hilarious Bart Owl scream. I think I you guys heard that one. Yeah, yeah we I did. It, Lisa. Yeah. 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 Um, and then him urinating, and some very um, unusual behavior that he's still doing this year. If it is a he, sounds like a he. Um, I don't want to get into that part of it, but uh, he's constantly, uh, it sounds like he's taking a branch and whacking the ground. Now, prior to that, when I first started recording him, um, I would occasionally hear mice squeaking or small rodents, and you could hear him rushing around and through the leaves as if it sounded like he was chasing these to catch them. Um, and now this year in almost every audio, it sounds like he's got a branch and in the audio I sent you, um, he had just finished, I counted whacking the ground 60 times with this branch in the dark. Now the area that they're in, um, I'm recording right in front of a swamp that's created by, um, some beavers. They had, uh, dammed up a small stream and created a flooded area that's uh, deep and large year round. Um, so there are a lot of frogs in the area. I come across them all the time on the ground or tree frogs. You can hear them in some of the recordings uh, somebody sent to you. So I don't know if he's, if he's maybe come up with a creative way to locate mice or frogs at night by, you know, whacking a a larger area because he's repeatedly whacking the ground. Any thoughts on that? Lisa, I, was, I don't know. Lisa, I was just wondering. Um, I had an encounter a couple of weeks ago and we heard what we thought were at first, we thought they were bullfrogs, but they didn't sound like bullfrogs to us. Have you yes, ever heard, I listened to that? Have you ever heard anything like that in, in, in your area at all? Um, not in this area, but, um, I moved up from the Northern Catskills and, um, when they, the group would return to the juvenile at the recorder, um, the first two, uh, it wasn't the alpha male. The first two would come in and make this sound that almost sounded like a frog, but it had kind of a tackle to it. And anybody I asked, um, they said, oh, that's a frog, that's a frog. But it, it, it most definitely was not a frog. But um, none of the groups I have are near any large bodies of water where there's actual bullfrogs. They're not on any lakes. Um, we have mostly tree frogs, leopard frogs, and toads because, you know, they're, they're very wooded areas. <clears throat> you know, growing up fishing as a kid, you know, I've always seen bullfrogs at the pond. Um, but that's just not the case where any of the three groups are located at. So that's the closest I can say I've heard them imitate a frog, but it would be more of a tree frog. We call them spring peepers up here, even though you can hear them all summer long. Yeah, we call them the same thing. Lisa, don't, don't you just love it when people who know nothing of the topic uh, want to want to throw their two cents worth in and tell you what what well let me tell you what you're really hearing oh yeah I, in fact got into 
I, I wasn't arguing, but this guy was very adamant and very nasty that it was nothing more than a frog. And um, he went on YouTube, excuse me, he went on Google and, and I went on Google after he said this because I knew it was not a frog. You know, I've been in the, in the woods since I'm very little and um, I couldn't find any frogs. And I found a lot of frog audio, you know, on the internet, but none of it came even close. You know, it had a weird cackling sound to it, aside from the frogish part of it. So, but boy, he yeah. was nasty. He was he was really nasty. That you know, I was saying it was something it wasn't. <laughs> well, you know what I usually do in those situations is, I'll say, "Wow, that's that's great." You know, now I was parked here. Now, where was where was your vehicle? Because I. I didn't. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, oh, you were you were nowhere near this place. Okay, you need to shut That's your mouth. That's a good then. one. Yeah, right. That's a good one. Yeah, I get that a lot. Get that a lot. That's why I think that's why I don't have a YouTube channel. <laughs> right. Oh, we had a guy years ago. Will, you know who I'm talking about? <laughs> uh, it's even on the uh, on the episode where he said. When he had his first encounter, he said, you know, if uh, if somebody wants to come up to me and say, well, I know you think you saw a Bigfoot, but let me tell you what you really saw. He says, I I'm willing to sit in jail for a few days over that one. Are, are we talking yeah. about Lee by chance? <laughs> no, 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 not oh. Lee. <clears throat> talking about some, somebody else that was in the military. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I think with that owl, I finally, you know, was able to get, you know, everyone talks about was it an owl, wasn't it an owl, was it a 300-pound owl, an 800-pound owl. I finally got that clear recording of, um, and the first one I lost, unfortunately, actually sounded as if it were a person at first, um, and then went into the to the barred owl. It almost had a human quality to it. Um, that really made it obvious that it, it wasn't an actual owl. But anyone um, who's listened to that particular one, the new one, um, the first thing they say is, I don't know what that is. You know, they're not really even familiar with, you know, the call of a barred owl. When we used to have a ton of them in the Catskills, and we used to, you know, compete with each other to see who could call them in the closest at night you know, before the jig was up and, you know, we've actually had them fly right over us, you know, in the dark, a pair of them, but they'd get pretty close and then, then they knew it wasn't uh, a real owl. So, well, I think it's pretty cool that you could do that. When I was a kid, we had an area that not too far from my house, it was, uh, I don't know, a couple, two, three acres. And it had, at one time it had been a, uh, well, I don't know, a nursery with greenhouses. The greenhouses are in disrepair, but we'd sit in one of the greenhouses and you'd hear those things making that sound at nighttime. Is a lot of, it was just kind of interesting added to the yeah. uh, night ambiance. Yeah. You know, I, I um, sent everybody that audio. What did you all think? What? Uh, my phone's not going to let me listen to it while I'm on the call. It said I'm unable to play while I'm on the call. So. Okay. Can I? I just listened to that, Will. <clears throat> um, Lisa, who said yeah. what? <laughs> Actually, I'll I'll what? play it. I'll play it on the mic, and then I'll put it on the end of the recording, guys. Let me. Yeah. Uh, okay, my phone's wanting to court. Okay, let me let me play it here. Oh yeah, that's, that actually came across pretty well. <laughs> yeah, come on, guys, that's definitely an owl. We all know that. Did, did, did you pick up the sarcasm? <laughs> Maybe your owl. Yeah, he was big on the coast. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I had my my volume on really high because uh, the audio. Uh, I had recorded it on one of my uh, recorders that's on the way out. So I couldn't get the uh, audio high enough, so I had it on full volume. And then that 
<laughs> that scream comes along and nearly blew out my eardrums because he was very close to the recorder when he did it. So who there thinks that's an owl? <laughs> Well, you know, I've recorded real those owls. owls before, uh, Lisa. They're they're the ones that are they weigh about twelve hundred pounds. They walk yeah. on two legs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can't get away from them I, quick I've enough. I've heard about those. I've heard about those, Tom. I believe that might have been one of them. Right. <laughs> I think I'm. Is that Chuck that was on the last show talking about? You guys were talking about owls during the daytime. That was me. Just crazy. Yeah. Well, I when I was listening to it, um, it brought back an experience I had uh, with that very same thing on my very first day out in the woods after I had learned that Bigfoot was in every state except Hawaii. And I had spent a winter recovering from facial surgery. And... Um, so I was given a Kindle and I just started doing some research and I was always interested in Bigfoot and um, lo and behold, I find out that they're everywhere. They're not just in the Pacific Northwest. And I spend a lot of my time hiking in the Catskills, <laughs> always have picking mushrooms. And I found that big row of tree breaks um, almost a mile long up the mountain that I had. Uh, it was my very first interaction with Will. I sent him, a bunch of these pictures and uh i had an app where if I, when i take a picture it showed plots it on google earth so he could see this line wherever um, a picture was taken it put a dot on the map and then it, if you click on it it would open up that picture well that day um it led me up to a plateau and it was broad daylight and as i was coming down i was following a little spring creek maybe 50 feet off from the line of tree breaks. And I heard an owl call, a barred owl call. So I called back and I saw it and it was a young owl. It was, wasn't fully grown. And I called, it called back and it followed me all the way down to the main trail. It was, it was very eerie. It was like, I don't know why this owl is following me. He clearly can see me. And I'm hooting back to it. I'm doing the barred owl call back to it. And it's doing it back to me. And he followed me all the way down to the main trail from tree to tree. Very weird. And I could see him now, clear as day. In my hunting So, club, yes, they do, they do, they do call during the day. This was something, though, that I learned or... or, or figured out here on the show because there were a lot of times when we heard owl calls during the day when we were hunting, you know, it never dawned on me that they usually, unless they're disturbed, they usually don't make calls during the day. The only That's actual right. owl that I ever heard, um, we were getting in tree stands and there was a guy in a tree stand about 75 yards from me. I could actually see him climbing up the ladder to the tree stand. And all of a sudden I heard a ruckus and I heard a whole bunch of cussing coming from over there. When he had climbed up into the stand, there was an owl roosting in it. Oh, and the owl geez. nearly tore him up trying to get out of there. And, uh, so the owl started yeah, cussing? It, yeah, it was making noise as it flew down through the woods, you know. That was the only owl I'd ever heard during the daytime, you know. Yeah, same with this one that just, followed me down. That's why it was, it, it stood out. It was so peculiar because it's not normal. Um, did anyone ever hear of the park ranger? I think it was in New York state many years ago. Um, he was out in the woods and he had a raccoon hat on with the tail on the back and he was actually killed by a great horned owl came down and thought it was taking a raccoon and its talons actually punctured his skull and he was killed. Wow. I okay. have not heard that. But they do have yep. an incredible God damn it. Owls and hawks and eagles have an incredible force with their talons. Yeah. Hey guys, I just Oh yeah. I've actually I'm sorry. Oh Go good. Um, I actually had the chance to um fly some falcons. Um I forgot the gentleman's name, he's passed on. 
Um, and he's credited with saving the peregrine falcon from extinction by uh, creating a breeding program where they don't imprint on humans. And uh, Heinz Meng, that was his name. He was a professor at um, New Paltz University, or New Paltz, excuse me, New Paltz College in New York. And I got to fly his falcons. And the one I flew was a hybrid. It was a peregrine with a prairie falcon. So it was much larger than a regular peregrine falcon. And I can tell you firsthand, even with gloves on, the strength in their talons is, is just incredible. Okay, I looked up um, owl, owls and when they call. Okay, it says owls hoot, scream, and call out at night for the same reason birds chirp and sing to establish and protect their territory, to woo females, and to signal the presence of a predator, among other reasons. Uh, the only reason they are so vocal in the dark is because most owls are nocturnal, or at least uh, crepuscular. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And it also says, <laughs> do owls make noise in the daytime? Question mark. Two species of owls hoot during the day because they are diurnal, which means they're equally active day or night. Uh, and the day is their natural time to be active. The crep crepuscular or nocturnal owls may all a species may hoot during the day if they are disturbed predators are nearby or if they hear other owl sounds uh so that's that kind of goes Burling along with what you're saying back. so you hooted back to the yep. owl and he responded hey will exactly. what is the name of the owl that's diurnal that'll hoot in the daytime uh, you know it didn't a say burling owl? I think the small burrowing owls are active because they eat insects, they eat like grasshoppers, and they generally, um, they net their ground nesting, they usually take over prairie dog uh, holes, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm trying Interesting. to, trying to okay. see which ones, if they list, oh, it says which owls are diurnal. You know, these are, I hate these articles, they're like 9,000 paragraphs long before they get to what to, to answer the question so um, well well they get paid by the word yeah, right <laughs> huh says most owls don't or most owls don't hoot uh, they use screeches and caws that's interesting uh, okay um, this is a barn owl not bart owl Though nocturnal, might hunt during daylight hours, if weather, uh, if bad weather keeps it from doing so at night. Uh, says also the says the northern hawk owl or northern pygmy owl. There you go. The only diurnal haw uh, owls. There's two species: the northern hawk owl and the northern pygmy owl. Right. Are diurnal. Right. And they don't weigh 300 pounds, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> let's, let's hope not anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't found one that has been able to out-scream me, so. <laughs> until, until this recent I'd like recording. The tree sitting in. What's that? I said, I'd like to see the tree those big owls are sitting in. <laughs> so I guess the <laughs> question. Yeah, right? down here in the <laughs> so I guess the question goes back to then, you know. You did see, you did interact one and see with one one day. However, these other recordings. That's out of the, yeah, ordinary. Yeah. These other recordings are what? Well, the other, the recordings Definitely you have, owls. yeah, are not owls. No. And you know, again. And I do the, get owl calls on my recordings, but they're, it's very easy to tell them apart, generally. Yeah, I think that's the important thing, too, is being able to compare audio of known things yeah. to unknown things exactly and not assume just because you you hear all the time that that bigfoot mimic owls that every owl you hear at night or on a recording is going to be a bigfoot it's just the same thing with the coyotes you know when coyotes scream and then you'll hear um, the bigfoot almost mimic them mimicking them in the same you know yipping and calling Oh, I've heard it myself, and, and what I've heard was they didn't do the yipping and all that kind of stuff, the barking, was the Bigfoot noises were very distinct. They would sound to the untrained ear like coyote, but they weren't. 
Right. When you hear known coyotes, you hear all the, you know, the, the howls and the yipping and the barking, and there's always a cluster of them doing it. With the Bigfoot sounds, yes, they were exactly. singular. There was an individual doing it, and they were from start to, st- in each each vocal segment, from start to finish of each piece, uh, there would be a consistency. You know, they would stop, there'd be a break, and then there would be this noise again. Very, very unlike, right. very uncanine like we'll, we'll say. Right. A wolf may, a lone wolf may howl, but I don't think I've ever heard of a lone coyote howling. It's always a pack. Be- seems to be a pack behavior. Yeah, where I grew up, we had, or a group behavior. there were at least, there were at least two, maybe three packs of coyotes in that area. And, and we'd hear them often, you know, so you, you knew when the coyotes when were When coyotes out. run. Yeah. When coyotes run, they make that yipping noise. And they yeah. always either sound like they're coming towards you or going away from you. Uh, yeah. They don't do a lot of howling. They, they do no. the yip and the, and the little small barks and things like that, you know. Right. Uh, they I've don't do a same howl. For, I've hunted coyotes for 30 years. And, uh, you know, I, I know I, I would I could be able to tell I had coyotes coming towards me when I made a few calls. And I I would hear the yip yip yips and and you know you would it was like y'all said you'd hear several of them it wouldn't just be one it would be right three four eight sometimes there would be ten of them yip yip yipping and I'm like oh crap I hope you know I can scare them off before yeah. they get to me you know but yeah you never they, hear they a, a single long sustained howl from a coyote no usually you hear you know one starts and then two or three or four or the rest, the whole rest of the pack joins in. Some of the exactly. hunting land I used to hunt on was close to a railroad track. And for some reason, there's a crossing there that had the alarm bells on it, you know, and the the arms that drop down. Yep. And that would set these coyotes off every time a train went by, you know. Yep. And my sister lives Same thing up here with ambulances. Track. Sorry. Man. Yeah, and it it's still the same way. My sister lives not too far from there. And we've been in her yard at night, you know, and have heard, you know, a train coming. And then all of a sudden, as soon as those alarm bells start going off at that crossing, the coyotes would just start one and two and then three. And pretty soon you got eight or 10 coyotes. Sounds like coming from every direction, just howling and making <laughs> a ruckus. And as soon as the yep. train went by, they quit, you know. They quit, yep. Yep, I've heard that with sirens up here. When a siren would go by, it sometimes sets them off. And, I mean, uh, domestic dogs do that sometimes, too, so it must just be a canine behavior. Well, Lisa, I oh, got yeah, a question when, for you. Whenever those coyotes would start like that, every dog in the neighborhood would start, you know. Yeah. Even my, my my niece's little dog, he's, she's got a real tiny little, some sort of poodle thing or something. I don't know, but. Even he would start howling, you know. Really? <laughs> That's funny. Well, Lisa, I got a question for you. Sure. Um, I'm just curious. What kind of what kind of structures do you find up in that that part of the woods up north like that? Or do you find structures, wood structures? Well, anytime I go looking for a group, um, and I go into an area of woods. Um, I see basically the same type of, um, I don't want to call them structures. You don't see, and it's just me, and I've been out in the woods a lot. I've bushwhacked a lot. I used to pick mushrooms. Um, You don't see teepee structures here. It's very rare. I've seen one, and it's still questionable whether it's human-made or or made by them. Um, you see a lot of tree bends. You see, obviously, tree breaks. Um, let's see. You do see what was I was told was called stuffing, where they um, take small branches and they pile them up, like in the crotch of a tree. If a tree starts off and it ends up having two trunks going in opposite directions, you see a lot of um, short tree, short, um, almost log-like pieces that it looks very unnatural that all that fell right in that place. You see a lot of leaners where they'll lean a lot of tree. Um, they'll either push over 
the last jig one I found was um, not not a teepee, but um, some of the long, maybe 20 foot dead pieces were dragged from another area or it included ones that were right there and pushed over. So you see a lot of symmetrical type structures, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, it makes like sense. They, I've seen the same thing in my in my area here in Oklahoma. Yeah, not you don't see these big TP, you know, structures or any of that. But um, when you go in, when I go into an area and I know immediately this is where I'm going to put a recorder, um, you just see a totally abnormal amount of tree breaks and bends and just uh, stuff that looks too odd. It's it's you know to be a, a coincidence, you know, that so many trees, you know, just happen to be lined up in this, you know, the crotch of one tree. So I don't know. Do you guys see teepee like structures and, you know, I, things that I people immediately in, think of when they. I have here in Oklahoma, I've seen teepee structures and um, the biggest structure I've ever seen was probably 14 or 15 feet tall. And, wow. uh, and it was probably, uh, I just estimate probably 20 or 30 yards apart. And it was just, it was an amazing structure. And wow. I've, I've seen a lot of structures like that. Some of them are smaller, some of them are larger. Um, I've found X formations in the woods, which is really <laughs> odd to me. I uh, don't really know what that means, but, uh, Somebody. I have seen those before too. Um, I was just uh, reading something, uh, somebody's opinion on uh, the X formations, which I don't see often. And I believe they were researching in your area. They were in the South. And they said that the X's were, um, they found the X's as uh, boundary markers for other Bigfoot groups. And whenever he was in an area that had groups that were very near to each other, he would see a lot of those almost territorial markers. Whereas to me, the tree breaks that I have found have always been directional markers. Sometimes going down the road, there's, there's woods on either side of the road. I'll see a tree break one on one side of the road and one exactly on the opposite side of the road in the other set of woods, almost like cross telling them to cross here. They've always been directional, whereas um, I don't see the X's up here. And um, if this guy's theory is true, um, it would make sense because you don't have very large groups butting up against each other, I don't think, as much. And that's just a theory. Well, I can, the theory, I, I can tell you what, what an Indian buddy of mine told me when we first started finding the breaks. And and he chuckled and he says, "Oh, you finally found those." And I'm like, "Well, yeah. You want to tell me what it is?" And he and he chuckled again. He says, "Well, he says those are those are territory markers." Uh, he says, "What you found, like you did, Lisa, the line. I found the same thing." He said, "That's that's right. the big guy of the group telling the rest of which way we're going to the next feeding area." Uh, so exactly, this led right down to that creek in a ravine. Yeah, so on the top of the mountain. So if you find them close together like that, that's usually a directional thing. Um, yep. And you know, and, and Tom, you know what we saw uh, in in Oregon last summer, and what was most important, um, you know, because the tree breaks don't take a lot of effort. So you got to think about this. If they're going to go through a lot of effort for something, there's a big reason behind it. So they're going to do what's right. easiest for them to do. And, and reaching up and grabbing a tree and breaking it over, that's pretty simple. Um, what was most important, we drove about 30 miles from one area we were looking at to another area through through the forest up there. And I said, now, if these breaks were natural, tell me, count. I said, just you know, keep quiet, keep to yourselves, and count along the way how many you see. And there were none. There was zero across 30 miles of forest. Uh, and, and that was as important as finding the things because uh, it sort of legitimized, you know, what they were. I said, if this, if exactly. this was naturally occurring, you'd see it often, and you don't. Right. That is super important. Yeah, I remember well, that. Well, I use it as an indicator of where I'm going to record. When I walk in a, 
you know, I look on Google Earth and I say, okay, this matches my parameters. A couple hundred acres. It's surrounded on all sides by roads. And I walk in there and I'll either see all that or I won't see that. And every time I've seen it and put a recorder in, I've got gotten them every time I put the recorder in without fail. And areas without anything in them, nothing. That's very interesting. Yeah, typically like in, in our, area, our areas and yours, um, when you see the markings like that, that's a good indicator that that's when the creatures are present in that area. If you don't see those markings, you're not going to get anything. Exactly. Um, here's a question for you in reference to teepee-like structures. Um, where you hear people talk about um, finding a lot of them. And since that's not the case for me, the one I found, the only thing that led me to think it was legitimate was it was about 12 to 15 feet tall. I sent a picture to Will, but it was years ago. Um, and right next to it was a little miniature one, almost like a juvenile practicing. It was, um, it was a little tiny tree break and branches lined up almost as if it was trying to make one. Lisa, and there were two deer bones inside of it. Not the deer yes. bones, but a little tree. I saw that only once. And again, and this was probably a tree that was seven and a half foot tall. It was um, a little hemlock. I was there exactly a week earlier on this path that I would hike. And it's actually an area that Will was at last summer. And uh, so I'd hiked up there and it's right at a location right next to the path. I was there exactly a week later and somebody had snapped it over. All the other trees were in perfect condition, uh, but that one. So it was obviously intentional. I don't know what the purpose of it was. But, uh, yeah, very interesting. That was the only time I – well, no, I take it back. There was two times I saw little ones, but this one was particularly small, only only about seven and a half feet tall. Well, you know, my thoughts on well, here's that – Here's a question I have. If, if they're – I think when they're in an area, the reason they would mark their being, their presence, is if another group were coming through the area. That way they'd know that there was a group present feeding there. Well, here's a question. Um, you hear a lot about – these teepee structures, which I'm not familiar with because, you know, in the Catskills or the Adirondacks, like I said, other than that one, I don't see them. Um, could they be associated with a certain subtype of Bigfoot? And that's why they're in other parts of the country because overall, they like the tree breaks are the same in New York as they are in California. Right. A lot of these... Um, things they do are exactly the same but not the not the teepee these big elaborate teepee structures you know people see in photographs right i, I think you're right about that so, um in fact i was just messaging tom about that that you know that seems to be a a regional phenomenon it's not it's not everywhere and i know there's people listening right. that'll say oh yes they are it's everywhere no it's not you know, I've spent 50 years yeah. on the West Coast, all up and down the West Coast, thousands of hours out there, never once seen anything like that, uh, and seen the same things that you find, which I think is more of a, a northern hemisphere type of th uh, thing. Whatever it is they're doing, they, they do in accordance with what they have in their particular regions. Uh, but it could be very different, say, where Chuck is. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Lisa, I found a we found a structure one time and we actually named it the wigwam uh, because wow. this structure was pretty impressive. And all, all the logs on this structure were interwoven in between to make this structure happen. And wow. a month later, we went back out there to take a look at it again. And just like what Tom was saying inside this structure, we found a little bitty structure that was almost made exactly the same as the, the big one that was there. 
And, right. And, That's what I found that one time. And I, to me, that was the first thing that went through my mind. Uh, I don't know if I'm correct or not, but it seemed to me like the juvenile was learning how to make that same kind of structure in that area. And that's exactly it was, what it, it appears was, to me. It was a pretty cool find. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what really um, was more amazing than the structure itself that I found um, because I never found one before, but the miniature one right next to it. And just as much time had been put into this little one and it was much cruder. Um, they even bent over a live sapling to interweave into the top of the part of the teepee structure, which is another thing that made me think it was not a humans because um, at that point it would have been up almost 14 feet in the air to have done that. Um, but this little one right next to it made from a tiny tree break um, and then sticks against it, uh, you know. Yeah, First thing you what, think of when you look at it like. is, is this is a little kid, you know, imitating its its parents that's trying to make a child size one. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Will, what's your take on yeah. that? Why do you think they do this kind of stuff? Well, it's something I'm not familiar with. And the only thing I can say is, um, and and something to keep in mind is our, our friend Wynn from the Flathead Reservation. Uh, we were I showed him some pictures of these ones. And his take was, he says, well, you know, hunters a lot of times, and this is out of ease of what they bring with them, if they're, if they're going out, and he was speaking about native hunters, but others also too. Uh, if they're going to go out and stay the night in a location, they'll just carry a tarp because it's easier. And they'll take whatever materials are there to lean up against trees, etc., and then put the tarp on them. Then when they leave and move on the next day, they'll just take the tarp and leave the structure in place. So, you know, playing devil's advocate, you have to consider those things too. Right. Another thing with these TP structures are, are uh, the like, they don't appear to me to be um, created as a um, something for shelter. That's the word I'm looking for. They don't, to me, they don't seem like they're built, you know, you know, for, for shelter, for the purpose of sheltering them from the elements, you know, the, either the size of them or where they're located, you know, close enough to humans that why would they shelter in plain sight, you know? So they don't come across to me as being built for shelter purposes, so if that's the case, what are they built for? You know, that's a good point, Lisa, because that's what I've noticed, too, is like if these are shelters, they're pretty um, they're not very well built. They're not well designed. And and could you imagine uh, Bigfoot building this thing and then just hanging out there for, for what reason? I mean, they're they survive just like all the other wild animals do in very harsh conditions, you know, in snow and rain and, and all sorts of things. So and there's no proof they um, need shelter. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the point I was trying to make is who knows these, I would say if anything else, these are, uh, you know, I used to be in the coast guard. I think of these as, uh, range markers, <laughs> you know, yeah. buoys, right. these are land buoys. And maybe they're symbolic of something, you know, that we just don't understand. You know, if they're as smart as, you know, we know they are. Right. And uh, they don't appear, you know, I've never seen one that I would say, okay, you know, they're building themselves a little, you know, log cabin in the woods, you know. Well, here's a thought, too. Uh, one of the things we know is they will follow waterways to navigate cross country. You know, just like we would. It's easier to follow a body of water from point A to point B than it is to try to go cross country through, you know, forest where you can't see very far ahead of you. Uh, what if they were making stuff like that as sort of a marker? You know, kind of like blazing a trail in a way, marking your route. Uh, I guess you'd. Yeah. Have, I guess what you'd have to do is you'd have to. You'd have to plot those on a map and see. Well, are they out in the middle of nowhere or are they near waterways? Right. Forest. And what to me, thoughts? the amount of time and effort put into making them is a factor in all of this too. It is. 
some are very crude and some are very elaborate and, you know, made with hundreds and hundreds of sticks, you know, and carefully woven while others are much cruder. So, um, there's a, well, and like, it's, it's very fascinating. And, and also you have to consider too, like crop circles, you know, are some Doug and Dave or are they legitimate? Exactly. Or Boy Scouts. I have a question. Yeah, thing. I, I, um, and this is to everybody. Um, I'm down here in Alabama, and I've never seen anything like what y'all are talking about, you know, structures like that. We have awful lot of tornadoes down here, though, and the tornadoes yeah. will twist the tree off 20 foot up, you know, and usually the top is folded down next to it, or there's a big enough tornado that's just gone. It's just a trunk 20 foot tall, you know. But I've never seen any structures like that when I was younger and hunting in the woods and everything. Never seen anything that puzzled me like that. Do Does any of you know of structures like that being found down here in the South? I've never been in the South, so looking in the woods, so I can't answer that. Well, I can't speak to uh, any tree structures. Uh, it seems my guys just like to go in circles. Um, um, <laughs> I had, you know, my first uh, indication of, that they might be here was uh, because I had actually heard uh, Will talk about this on uh, a channel, was the limbs being pulled down in my cedar trees, my big cedar trees back there in the back. Um, and twisted and they were hanging down from like about uh anywhere from 10 to 20 feet up in the tree that's all i ever saw around here um and, how and many, then how many per tree i'm sorry what multiple ones from the same tree were they multiple ones um i had one tree that had three of them in it and then the, all the other trees just had one Mm. And I have I yeah. have found them in um, a couple of the trees after I put the fence around the uh, the house here. I found I went out there and I had uh, one cedar tree that had two of the the limbs <clears throat> twisted and hanging down. And I know that they weren't that way before because I had been out there with my little hand chainsaw. I had been cutting all the sucker limbs off the bottom, so maybe I. I tick somebody off by doing that. I don't know. But, I mean, you guys know the only thing I've had in, around here that I can speak to that's unusual were the the circles, you know. My, my what figure kind of eight circles? There. What kind of circles? Um, yeah. There was a path about uh, three feet wide, beat down around um, two groups of cedars, and they formed uh, perfect circles and a perfect figure eight. And then there was a path leading off the north side of one down towards the, the tank, water tank. And then, um, then the one to the uh, south side, they had another one leading out towards um, the ranch across the road from me. I've never heard of that before. I have seen something, and I'm curious if you guys out west see it because um, you have when you have logging out there, sometimes you have small clear cut areas, which I've heard you guys talking about before. They're beneficial for the ungulates, the elk, and the deer because they create browse for them. Um, whenever we have um, up here um, clear cut areas for I don't know putting in buildings or the such, you'll see tree breaks where they stopped, almost like them saying, don't go any further. Um, it, it's very common to see after, you know, people have gone in there and just clear cut. In fact, just down the maybe three miles from me, they did about a 10 acre swath on the side of the road that backed up to woods. And there were probably three on each side length of the clear cut area right along the edges right after they completed these tree breaks that weren't created by 
the, the machinery used to, to clear cut the area to knock everything down. Has anybody seen something like that? I don't think I don't think we paid any attention to that, did we, Tom? No. Um no, not that I'm aware of. So, you know, there could be something going on out there that we don't know, but I don't, you know, at this juncture, uh, I don't think we've attributed anything, you know, Sasquatch related to that. I've just seen it multiple times, so I was, and now I look for it, you know, when I see them clearing out some land, you know, to build something. Sure. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I look, I look I, for it. I think it's beneficial to be looking at everything, mm -hmm. taking pictures of everything, and you don't have to necessarily draw an immediate conclusion, but no, you just you are being aware, and then you start, you know, maybe a trend or a pattern starts to develop. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The dots. yeah. Right. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'm not saying it's them, but it's just unusual that you know, they're not, I find them, because I'm looking, I'm seeing them more and more, and I'm paying attention more and more. That's a good point, Lisa, is once your awareness is up with these creatures, and you know what to look for, then, yeah, absolutely. You, you start to see things that uh, people who are not looking for them are just going to miss just the everyday, you know, they'll, they'll just hike right past it or walk past it or drive past it. So, yeah, that's a very sure. good point. Well, that that's what amazed me was beforehand. Spent, I mean, since, you know, as long as I can remember, I, I had my own canoe when I was, you know, 10, 12 years old. I'd be out fishing. We'd be out, you know, camping in the woods during the summer. You know, we, it was a different time back then. And, um, all the time I've spent in the woods, either fishing on trout streams. Um, it wasn't until I came across this information that, that Bigfoot were everywhere that I had to go out immediately and look for these signs. And I found them, and, and it was like, how did I miss this all along? Because it's part of the I background noise. Exactly. And, you know, I never thought about it until I went to Bob Titmus's house once back in the 80s. And he showed me, and, and for him, it was just kind of an anomaly because he only noticed it once, didn't really pay a lot of attention to it, but as they were following a line of tracks one time in the Bluff Creek area, they were finding these, and it was just branches that were snapped over and kind of twisted back on themselves. And he says, well, you know, we I don't know if they do this or not. He says, we, we found this, you know, periodically while we were following this line of tracks. And I didn't think much of it either because what he brought home, he had, he had piles of these in his house that he collected along this particular, you know, uh, line of tracks they followed. And we both just kind of scratched our heads and like, well, okay, you know, whatever. Because I thought it was a one-off thing. And he says, I don't know, maybe they just do it as they walk along and just snapping these things over, which could very well have been. And then, you know, a number of years later when we were climbing this ridge, uh, in southern Washington, we found that line of trees that were snapped over. And and to me, that was just, it was incredible, because there was nothing else that could have possibly done that. Yep. Well, you saw the pictures I sent you. These weren't saplings that were No, same broken. here. They weren't and saplings. it just turned out they were all fresh. Um, the majority of them were fresh, and, and, you know, five, six inches, you know. Mm -hmm. These were hefty, you know. They weren't full-grown trees, but by all, you know. Pretty decent size anyway. Yeah, absolutely. They weren't, you know, two or three inches. They were much bigger. And, um, they, you know, I could follow them line of sight straight up, you know, for, for a mile. So from the stream all the way up to a plateau, and then there was a boulder field if you went immediately from the plateau to the top. So they continued to round back the mountain and then up almost like the path of least resistance. Yeah. We didn't follow ours all the way out. We followed them. Well, you could only see about a hundred yards. So when you go to the next one, then you could see an additional hundred yards. So that's how we followed them. 
Um, exactly. But had we, but what they were doing, we because like I said, we didn't follow, we didn't get to follow the whole line of them because of daylight constraints and and uh, the terrain. We had to get out of there. We had to cross a river to get out of there before dark, but on foot. So, um, but the direction they were going and what I found out a few years later was consistent with how they were feeding and moving throughout their range. So what they were doing was they were moving from one feeding area to the next, moving in the correct progression throughout the range that I learned that they did do. Exactly. Well, after reading your books and doing research, you know, and then going out and finding these, you know, they were all snaps that, well, bend a tw- they had a twist to them, and they all pointed right down to this hidden stream, spring-fed stream down in a little ravine, and uh, you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't think they were anything other than trail markers just by the sheer number of them and the fact that they were all facing the same way and the fact that they were fresh. You know, it's funny too. Uh, you know, I don't know. It is until you learn what that is, you would go right by it and never, never even look at it, never glance at it. And exactly. And then once you do recognize, it's like, holy cow, how did I miss this? Because it's right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't exactly. You can't miss it I, when you once you do know what it looks like. Yep, I was flabbergasted. You know, the first day I went out looking for them, they stood out like a sore thumb. Evidence right in plain but sight. Before that, before that never even gave a second thought or even, you know, even seen one to say, gee, this looks weird. I wonder what it is. Yeah, exactly. Lisa, I had the exact same experience. I, I read Will's book and I think I heard him talking about, Will, how you would line them up and you go about a hundred yards and another hundred yards and another hundred yards so when I saw the first one of these things, you know, I just kind of followed them. And uh, one pointed to another, and they're about 100, 110 yards apart. And the last one pointed down to a lake that in the Chinook language translates to way of death, path of death, you're going to die. <laughs> I didn't go to the lake. Is, is there a message there, Tom? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I didn't want to find and, and, out. And you're here today, and you're here today to record this. <laughs> right. And actually, to get to that lake, it was the slope angle was such, even with all the trees and everything, you need a carabiner and ropes and all that kind of stuff to get down there. So I was like, you know, I wanted to go down to the lake and look for footprints, but not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it's it's amazing what you what you find if you know what to look for. <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. Is. Well, we're running running yeah. low on time, guys. Anybody have questions or anything they want to bring up with Lisa while we're still here? I was just going to tell Tom if he wants to repel, get that guy off that TV show to show you how. <laughs> you know, he knows right? he, he know everything. <laughs> Bear, bear growth. <laughs> oh no, no, no not, not that him. guy. Yeah. Oh man, so fake. <laughs> He'll set you up, good, Tom. Oh. You're talking about the guy from well, Expedition Bigfoot. <laughs> oh yeah. gosh, yeah. Oh, they just announced. Yeah, I, I was. Um, I don't know what I was reading an article on, um, but. It must have been not a Facebook, but there was a, a blog or something, and people saying, "Oh, everyone's got to write into Expedition Bigfoot. Tell them we want another. Uh, we not we want another season because I, I guess the show ended. I don't know. They announced the fourth season, didn't the they? Yeah, yes, exactly. Oh, and they Lord. just announced the fourth <laughs> season. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, there is. Uh, Tracy, I'm 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 kind of fortunate. I've got a an older brother who's a mountain climbing instructor and all that kind of stuff. So if I want to do that, then uh, and he actually teaches people on rock walls and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, this lake was something else. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's interesting, Tom? I just want to see if you can get that guy. <laughs> what, what you found, what I found, what Lisa found. When you're out there, you know, a lot of times that brush is really thick. And especially, you know, my find was in the middle of July, so it was summer, so all the leaves, everything was on. And 
if it were something that were I, I, you know natural or made by any other means then why was it only at the maximum uh distance line of sight you know what i mean so in other words you'd stand at one you'd look and and you couldn't see beyond where that marker was you'd go to that one right and then you'd look out and lo and behold the next one is right at the maximum line of sight because the brush was so th- too thick you, you, you can only see so far through the brush and so on each one of those was identical so and you only saw that one and you only saw the one understand. exactly so you would have to move from one to the next, just like, you know, we blaze trails, you know, by chipping some bark off a tree, the same thing. Exactly. So if, if it, you just looked at one, yeah. you'd say, what's the significance? Exactly. Until you found that second, and then you found that third. Right. And you realized there was a pattern going on. So it was definitely artificial. I mean, there was nothing, uh, nothing natural about those whatsoever. Right. Exactly. So if we establish the will that uh, Bigfoot has a higher IQ than you? Probably. (laughs) 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 I don't know that I could have figured out how to do something like that. (laughs) Well. Oh, by the way, guys, I just sent you, I um, took a photo of Google on Google Earth. um, just a snapshot and um, using my pen, I showed where I am and I showed where my areas are and the, and the distance between the, the different groups I've found, the three groups. So you should, you should have that in your emails, you, all of you. I got it. Okay. Well, well thanks all of you have, I, I have, on, I have Forrest, Will, and Tom. I don't have anyone else. Tracy, I'll, I'll send them to you. But, uh, and we and we go. will not post that anywhere. Yeah, I was and just going to say. Yeah, just don't post. You can post no. all the audio and and everything else. That's why, I, you know, I sent it. I think people when we talk about it on air, I, I'm sure the people would like to hear it. You know, so what we're talking about. So I, you know, I'm all for posting that. But anyone who lives in my area who would look at that picture using the lake as a guide they would find my areas. <laughs> yeah. And, that's, I, and I don't want to. That's not a good people thing. tromping through. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, guys, I hate to say it, but we are out of time. Lisa, we always appreciate Probably. you coming on and, and updating us. You've got some really fascinating stuff going well, on there. It, it's always a pleasure and an honor. So I thank you for inviting me. And I'll be looking for group number four now. And, and you should, yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'll keep you posted. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J E V N I N G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.